the most inscrutable and distant of offices. From SAS Rogue Heroes, The Authorized Wartime History, by Ben McIntyre. Fraser and his team, armed with a total of 40 loose bombs, were dropped by the LRDG 16 miles short of the target. From a safe observation point, they counted 39 planes on the airfield, including a number of Italian fighters parked wing to wing. At 9.15 p.m., in pitch darkness, they reached the airfield perimeter and slipped through the fence, carefully stepping over some tripwire booby traps. Over the next 30 minutes, they planted 37 bombs on planes with staggered timers to ensure that they all exploded at roughly the same moment. One bomb was found to have a damaged detonator the two remaining bombs were planted in the middle of a sandbagged building filled with shells, ammunition and incendiaries. The first bomb went off at 42 minutes past midnight, followed by three more in quick succession as the attackers scrambled off the airfield. Marching at speed for the rendezvous point, they tried to count the explosions. Then the bomb dump went up with a blood-curdling roar that sucked the air out of their lungs from half a mile away. The little team yelled with joy and excitement. The next morning, the LRDG trucks carrying Fraser and his men encountered the vanguard of Reed's flying column heading north. Fraser was summoned to report to the brigadier. Sorry, sir. I had to leave two aircraft on the ground as I ran out of explosives. But we destroyed 37, he told the delighted Reed, who thumped him on the back and exclaimed, There's nothing to stop us now. It later transpired that Rommel himself had been in the town of Agadabia that night. He must have had a bit of a headache, wrote Reed. Fraser, the most inscrutable and distant of the officers, had succeeded beyond all expectations and established an important principle. A team of just five men could wreck an entire airfield in a matter of minutes. On the 23rd of December, Fraser's team reached Jalo. An early Christmas celebration took place that night with roasted gazelle shot on the return journey, tinned Christmas pudding and hot lime juice with rum. It was, wrote the Cockney Bennett, a very, very nice Christmas. In the space of just one week, starting with Maine's raid on Tamet and ending with Fraser's attack on Agadabia, El Detachment had racked up an astonishing tally of destruction. More than 60 planes, at least 50 enemy killed or wounded, including a number of pilots, dozens of vehicles, several miles of telephone line, petrol dumps, a bomb depot, and a brothel. Two LRDG men escorting Fraser's group had been accidentally killed by a British bomber, but the SAS unit had not suffered a single casualty. Total losses amounted to one second-hand Italian lorry. Cooper wrote that at last the founding theory of El Detachment had been magnificently vindicated. Sterling had no intention of resting. Rommel was falling back and growing more dependent on air support than ever. The SAS 
would strike again. Fraser had been back in camp for only a few hours when Sterling asked him, with unanswerable politeness, whether he would mind heading back out again to mount another raid. If he was not too tired. It would be fun, Sterling said, and might even lead to the Grand Slam, 50 planes in one night. It was an order, of course, disguised as an invitation, which encouraged the recipient to feel as if he was actually volunteering. Sterling somehow managed to make a perilous and daunting mission behind the lines sound like a day at the races, a spot of competitive excitement with convivial company. Sterling suggested that after these first success, Fraser might like to attack the airfield at the Arco dei Fileni, the pompous stone arch erected near the coastal highway by Mussolini to mark the border between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. A triumph of fascist kitsch and a monument to Italy's colonization of Libya, the British derisively referred to it as Marble Arch. It never occurred to Fraser to turn down Sterling's courteous call to arms. No one ever did. At the same time, Jock Luz was detailed to attack the airfield at Nofilia to the west, equidistant between Surti and Marble Arch. Sterling and Maine would launch a second attack on Tamet and Surti. They knew the ground now. The enemy would not expect a repeat raid so soon and, even if they did, they would have had little time to erect more robust defences. Bill Fraser and his four-man team were quite unaware of the fate of Luz, who had been buried in a shallow grave that would never be found. They knew only that they had failed to link up with the LRDG and Luz's team and were now stranded in the desert 200 miles from Jalo Oasis with roughly a half pint of water each and enough sardines, bully beef and biscuits to last two days at most. The landing strip at Marble Arch had seemed impregnable with freshly dug trench defences and dozens of alert-looking German guards. The two SAS groups had managed to miss one another at the rendezvous site. Finally, concluding that the rest of the troop was not coming, Fraser and his men set off on foot, heading southwest. The last of the water soon ran out. On the third day, they came across a rank pool of brackish salt water. This had to be distilled. A laborious process that produced far too little liquid to combat the dehydration brought on by the heat, forced marching and diarrhoea. They resorted to drinking their own urine and eating berries, snails and tiny lizards found under rocks. On the 6th of January 1942, Ten days after being dropped near Marble Arch, the team nearly bumped into a squad of Italian engineers laying telephone lines. They hid until nightfall, then launched an ambush. The Italians were held at gunpoint while rusty water was siphoned from their truck radiator. The team then escaped back into the desert with two jerry cans of water some indeterminate jam, one tin of pears, and another of fishy spaghetti. Despite this gastronomic windfall, some of the men were deteriorating fast. Fraser decided, as he later put it, to get a lift. That night they worked their way back to the coastal road, lay in wait, 
and then flagged down a Mercedes-Benz carrying two German wireless operators. The frightened occupants were disarmed and ordered to drive, while the five British soldiers all crammed into the back, and Fraser held a revolver to the driver's neck. We were not going to leave the Jerrys behind to raise the alarm. After an hour, Fraser ordered the driver to turn off the road and steer south into the desert, in what he hoped was the direction of the front line. Some fifteen miles later, trying to cross a salt marsh, the car became irretrievably stuck. The Germans were pointed northwards and told to start walking. The British Eighth Army, Fraser estimated, should be about 50 miles to the east. The next 48 hours were eventful. They were shot at by Italian sentries, walked through a minefield, and ate the last of the food, a mouthful of sardines with jam. Some friendly Bedouin nomads supplied a few dates. A burned-out German vehicle a casualty of earlier fighting, was found to contain several blackened tins of meat, roasted by the heat, which were devoured with relish. A sandstorm erupted. Dimly through the swirling grit, troops could be glimpsed in the distance. Whether Fraser and his team would be shot or captured before they starved seemed an open question. Then came the sound of an English voice. The British soldiers advancing from Agadabia were highly suspicious of the hirsute ravenous figures staggering towards them out of the storm. They must have thought we were a band of savages, said one survivor, with our long matted hair and beards, faces and hands caked in dirt and torn ragged clothes. The men, wrote Fraser, had behaved admirably, displaying undimmed cheerfulness throughout the ordeal. Particularly noticeable was their determination not to be captured under any circumstances. A few days later, they were on their way back to SAS headquarters at Cabrit, where the rest of the detachment had now returned from Jalo for some well-deserved recuperation. The scattered loose party had also made it across the desert on foot, with the loss of only one man who had been unable to walk further and opted to wait and be captured. The survival of so many was greeted with astonished delight by their comrades, as if a party of ghosts had come back from the dead. The Odyssey had a permanent effect on Bill Fraser's appetite. Having come so close to starvation, whenever he caught the smell of cooking food, he had to eat something immediately to satisfy his lust. In a space of a fortnight, Fraser had almost died of thirst, drunk his own urine, crawled across a minefield, dodged bullets, hijacked a German car, eaten a tin of semi-cremated beef, crossed the front line and trudged for nine days across a hundred and fifty miles of desert. Reunited with his dog Withers, and utterly exhausted, he made his way to the tent he had vacated six weeks earlier, and was understandably surprised to find that, since it had been assumed that he was dead, his bed was now occupied by someone else. The Conservative Member of Parliament for Lancaster. 